Well, good morning to everybody, and we're already off to an incredible weekend. Had great services yesterday. Uh, we've got a, our, our new weekend schedule now with, with uh, a service for Life Church at 4.30 on Saturdays and a service for Mundo de Fe at 6 o'clock. We, uh, were off, we were off to a great start the first week we did them, and yesterday we actually grew in both of those uh, services. And so uh, we're, we're grateful to God for that, and great to have a great crowd here with us this morning. God is going to do something awesome today in our lives and in your family and in, a, in His church. So uh, let's get ready to receive the word of the Lord today. I want to get right to it because I got a lot to share with you today. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, pumped up and filled up. And there's so much exciting things going on. Besides what we're going to minister from the word of the Lord today, we're uh, about to launch our, our first session, our winter session for our connect groups. And uh, we're so excited about that. Uh, we've got a lot of them already posted on our website that you can sign up for. Uh, and uh, and we've got a few more that are going to be updated this week. Uh, but uh, there's ones for, for married couples. There's ones where you can serve people who are in need. Uh, we've got people that are, uh, of course, this Saturday is Soupmobile. And, and we make sandwiches for, for people in, in need here in Dallas. But we also uh, have a great connect group that is a part of that outreach, that overall outreach idea uh, that not only do we help with, uh, with making food for the homeless here in Dallas, but also we visit those that sometimes are forgotten in the nursing homes here around the area and just lots of different ways that we can reach out to people. So lots of exciting things uh, that you can be a part of. And if you're looking to get connected, I hope everybody here is looking to get connected a little bit more. Uh, this is a great on-ramp. It's a great opportunity, a great open door for you to take that next step. So it's an exciting time and Looking forward to sharing with some of our, our volunteers that served so faithfully this last year in 2018, <clears throat> of sharing with you guys this Friday night, a special time that we have set aside to talk. And then next Sunday, next Sunday, we are going to make a very, very exciting announcement and, uh, and talk a little bit more about vision, not just for our church, because that's important, but vision for your life vision for you for this year. And that's part of what we're looking at today. It has to do with our mindset for 2019. We started speaking a few weeks ago about four ways to look at 2019. And, and those four ways are first, we look back in gratitude. Second, we look down in humility. Third, we look up in hope. And today we're going to cover number four, we look forward in faith. Now, if you weren't able to be with us, that first point that we made about look back in gratitude, let me just tell you the highlights real quick, because actually this very first point is, is extremely important for what we're going to talk about today in the fourth point. You see, a few things about remembering. The purpose of looking back is to be grateful for the good things God has done. Never forget His blessings. The inability to look back with a healthy perspective blocks us from the ability to be grateful. And that will actually affect some other things because a proper perspective of the past fuels faith for the future. If you can look back on the good times and the bad and say, God, I thank you, I honor you, I glorify you, then you'll be able to look forward and say, God, no matter what comes, I thank you, and I honor you, and I glorify you. There is a correlation between negative memories and negative faith. And we're going to talk about faith today, so that's why I want to make sure we recap this part here today, because we, we've got to heal the, the hurts from the past and bad memories. Because it is hard to plant seeds of faith where a root of bitterness grows. We're going to learn today that faith is like a seed. And if you put that in soil that has bitterness, that seed will not grow. Faith, it will be very difficult for faith to grow. And we're here today because we want to be a people full of faith in 2019. Look back on the good things and look forward to the good things. Then we talked about look down in humility. And our key verse, our key takeaway came right from the words of our Savior Jesus Christ. In Luke 14, 11, he says, For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. We learn that, the, that there is a difference between the kingdoms of this world and the kingdoms of our God. 
That there are laws that operate in the natural that you and I see and and science can test and all those other kinds of things. And then there are laws of the kingdom that are sometimes called an upside down kingdom. It actually works the exact opposite of what we would think. And so using that scripture, we understand that the law of gravity says what goes up must come down. When the law of the kingdom says that what goes down must come up. And speaking of looking up, that was the third point, looking up in hope. And we saw this overlap, it kind of a segue for what we're going to talk about today with faith, because hope and faith are so intertwined. Psalm 3.3 says, But you, O Lord, are a shield around me. You are my glory, the one who holds my head high. And we finished out last week with this awesome prayer from Romans 15.13 that says, I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in Him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. So today... We're going to start on some new material, and we're actually going to finish this thought. Look forward in faith. Look forward in faith. If you've got your Bible, would you look with me right now in the book of Hebrews chapter 12? Hebrews chapter 12. Even if you use a digital Bible, if you use it on your phone or your iPad, go ahead and open that up right now. It's very good for us to interact with the Word of God, whether it be in paper form or in digital form. And whenever you're at church, and whenever we're, we're teaching and preaching, I, it's, it's important that you interact with the Word of God that way that you read it. And there's something maybe you want to highlight there, that you highlight that. So look with me in the book of Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews um, is one of the last uh, letters, epistles is a fancy word for it, uh, in the uh, New Testament. And it's towards the back of uh, the New Testament, almost at the end of your Bible. The book of Hebrews chapter 12, uh, verse 1, says the following, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Today, we're talking about looking forward in faith. So let's talk a little bit about faith and how that works. Faith is believing what you cannot see yet. It's believing things that you cannot see yet. That is the way that faith functions. We find in the chapter before we just read, in Hebrews 11, that's why what we read started off with the word therefore, because it was a continuation of chapter 11. Chapter 11, verse 1, is sometimes known as the faith chapter. It lists all these great Uh, heroes of the faith uh, throughout the entire history of the people of God in the Old Testament. And so Hebrews 11 verse 1 says, Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. There we see that segue and that overlap about hope that we talked about. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. We have to understand right from the very beginning that faith is invisible. That faith refers to things we are not able to see. That's the only time that faith can actually operate. Because otherwise, it doesn't require faith. If you can see it, it doesn't require any faith. I don't have to have faith that if I set my Bible down right here, that it, something's going to keep it from hitting the ground. Why? Because I can see this table. So it doesn't require any faith for me to put this down. Because I see something. Faith is for all those things we can't see yet. Now here's what the Bible says about that subject. In 2 Corinthians 5, 7, it says, For we live by believing, everyone say after me, believing, and not by seeing. What shapes our vision is not what our eyes see, but what our mouth declares. I want you to think about that here for just a second. Because if you don't have a vision yet for 2019, you think, well, I don't have a vision yet because I can't see anything. That's exactly why we need faith. And the way that we're going to be able to shape 
the vision for this year is not what we can see with our eyes, but what we start to declare with our mouth. You're going to see that connection here in a second. So eyesight is seeing what's visible. That's eyesight. Don't confuse eyesight and vision. Eyesight is just seeing what's visible. That's, that's when we go to the doctor and, and check our eyes and see if we need glasses. And I may or may not have done that last week. I may or may not need to start using some reading glasses because I may or may not have about to be turning 42 and somehow my arms have gotten a little shorter and people put things in front of me like this. My kids say, hey dad, look at this. I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah, check back with me when you're 42. Uh, that's eyesight, right? That's what you check at the doctor, right? Vision is proclaiming that what's invisible now will become visible soon. This is that connection between faith and vision. See, eyesight says, I don't see anything. Vision says, oh, I can see something. It's invisible, but I'm going to begin to declare it with my mouth. I'm going to speak it into existence. Because remember, there is power of life and death in the tongue. All right, so here's what Jesus says about that. In Luke 6, 45... It says, a good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart, and an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. What you say flows from what is in your heart. What you say flows from what is in your heart. You want to know the condition of your heart? You want to have a heart exam? Just examine your words. Your tongue is not separated from your heart. Your vocabulary, your words, it is not some segmented thing that's very distant and away from what is in your heart. Our mouth and our words are only an extension. They are a visible, or I guess in this case an audible representation of what is in our heart. So the way that we check the condition of our heart is to check the condition of our words. What are we saying? Proverbs 4.23 says, Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. And then Proverbs 10.11 says, The words of the godly are a life-giving fountain. I don't know about you, but sometimes I don't have a life-giving fountain coming out of this part of my face. Sometimes I say things I shouldn't. I don't speak the life that I should be declaring. That's why we're here, because we're always being renewed in our minds. We're always going back to the Word of God and saying, you know what? I need to change it to be, today to be a little bit more like Jesus. I need to change some things about the way that I'm speaking. And so for that to happen, I have to start in my heart, because my words are only going to be an extension of what is in my heart. This is the way it could work for some to maybe understand it visually. Heart leads to our words, which if these things are healed, if our heart is right, if our words are, are, are ordered from a healthy place, this will create hope, which all this together equals our faith. That's the way our faith works. Here's another way of saying it, kind of with some, some action verbs, if you will. Believe, declare, expect, this equals our faith. Here's a way to say it in sentence form. Believe with your heart, declare with your words, and expect in hope this is faith. This is the way that faith functions. This is the way that it works. All right? Now, when someone expresses doubt about what you know God has told you to believe in faith, it can destroy or it can fuel your faith. I got an idea, church. Why don't we let it fuel our faith? Why don't we see every resistance and opposition as an opportunity to make us stronger, to build character inside of us, and to become more resolute that this is what God has said. Now, maybe sometimes it's a word of wisdom, and we realize it wasn't something that God told us to do. Maybe it was our flesh told us to do it, and so that is a voice of wisdom that we've got to listen to. But a lot of times, it is something God has told us to do, and then the enemy will plant seeds of doubt, and most of the time, he uses people to do that. 
Now, there's a few things that are, in the Bi- that, that are not in the Bible that people think there are. This next phrase is not in the Bible. He who laughs last, laughs best. But it's good. I, I, could, make, I could make like a, a doctrinal case for that. It, that is biblical, right? Because God says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, right? Uh, he who humbles himself will be exalted, right? Because there's a lot of things people think are in the Bible. Like, there's nowhere in the Bible that says, when in Rome, do as the Romans, okay? God helps those who help themselves. <laughs> Cleanliness is next to godliness. None of that's in the Bible, y'all, all right? So, just, just add your name, right? First book of Johnny, chapter 1, verse 3, all right? Because so, <laughs> that's not in our Bibles, all right? So, uh, but there's, there's people that come against us. There is opposition. And you can let that destroy your faith or you can allow it to fuel your faith. You are sitting right now in a miracle. This room, this building, that parking lot, these lights, these screens, you are sitting in a miracle. Some of you guys don't know our story, but before we started Life Church in our, our Spanish service, Mundo de Fe, uh, was 18 years old. We had been in Carrollton for, for 18 years. And in 2010, circumstances uh, guided us to, to make a decision that it was time to find our own location. And we didn't have previous warning for this to happen. So we didn't have a capital campaign started. We didn't have a big savings account. And we were a fairly large church. We would be defined already at that point as a mega church that was looking for a building. So we knew that we had a limited amount of time. Abigail and I spoke with pastors Rolando and Holly. We had a very small staff at the time. They were our only other assistant pastors on staff at the time. And, and so we told them, hey guys, um, we feel that it, it's confirmation. It's time for us to make a move and we need to find our own building. So uh, we're about to embark on a big adventure. And so we all four started praying, started looking. And, uh, and Holly got on, on, on the internet on a website that has real estate that's available at a commercial level. And she recognized this building because she had brought her daughter, Lauren, here to do gymnastics back several years ago, way before we ever bought this building. And so she said, well, Tim, I found this, this one building. Um, it's pretty big. It's pretty cool. They only want to sell it. And I know we're looking to just lease something because we were looking like at movie theaters or, or schools that we could just rent on the weekend because usually to buy a building, you have to have a huge amount of savings and a down payment already in place. And, uh, and banks were, were not in, in the best of conditions at that time. We were right in the middle of a recession, maybe the bottom of the recession. You could say that it started in 2008. And uh, this was 2010 in the spring. And so we started looking and I said, well, it doesn't hurt us just to go by and look at the building. So the four of us came and the building was locked. And so we just kind of looked through the glass doors that are now our reception, our entrance, our, our, our entrance here at the church and, and looked around and thought, wow, this, this looks pretty nice. This looks pretty good. And we'd never even been inside. And this building, for those of you who are watching us online, it, it's a very beautiful building on the outside. But when you walk inside, it's like, whoa, most people are, are taken back. They don't expect it to be this big uh, and, and this nice when, when, they, when they come in. And so uh, we, we said, well, we'll set up an appointment with the real estate agent, but let's just, let's just go just so we know maybe one day what a building like that would cost us. And so uh, we set up the appointment, we came, we saw the building inside, and man, we thought, wouldn't it be amazing? It was like this mixture of excitement and of like, well, we, we better temper it down because there's like no way this is going to happen, right? And so it was like this guarded optimism, like it would be amazing, but there's no way. It's going to be amazing, but there's no way, right? And it was just like back and forth the entire time. And so uh, the agent asked us, well, what do you think? We said, oh, it'd be amazing, but you know, is there any way that we could do like a three-year lease on this? And this, no, the owner has to sell. He wants to sell. He is not interested in leasing. So, well, I appreciate your time. I, we'll keep this in mind and maybe one day something like this or, or maybe this same building will become available. Just, you know, let us know. And so we went on and kept looking at other places and we heard back that the owner said, hey, we'd really like to make this work for you guys. 
we, we, the, the sellers said, we want, want to make this work for you guys. And uh, they were all asking millions of dollars, millions of dollars for this building, as you could imagine. And uh, so we said, well, there, there's just no way we can. We would love the building, but there's no way that we can. We don't have the savings for something like that. We're just now actually building our, our credit history as, as an organization. Uh, and there's a long story behind all that, but it's, it, we're kind of starting from scratch. It was, like a, it was like a huge church of thousands that had barely existed in the eyes of banks or, or stuff like that uh, because of our previous circumstances. And so we, we, we said, well, we're going we're gonna, to you know, keep looking. And the owner said, no, 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 just work with me. If you guys can find a loan for $3 million from a bank, then I will do seller financing for all the rest. And it was several more million. We said, well, I mean, that's a big if, if we can find a loan. And then what kind of interest are you going to charge? Is something like 20% or something? No, 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 I'll, I'll, I'll work with you guys. We'll work something out. Long story short, after several miraculous things that happened and a lot of prayer and the favor of God in an unquestionable way, we were able to secure a loan at very fair terms, especially for us being kind of a, brand new entity in of ourselves. And we got the loan with the bank and we were able to negotiate the loan with the seller at phenomenal terms. Everything came together. That was July of 2010, July 11th, 2010. We had our first services here in this building. Later that year, we started our first life church service with about 20 or 30 people. And to God be the glory for everything that has happened since. So we were so excited and we were so grateful for this huge miracle that God had done. It was a huge step of faith. I'll never forget that the first day that we got the keys to the building, a bunch of us had been up here working. We had to recondition the whole building. This, this used to be gymnastics floor, what you're sitting in right now. Um, there was no stage, no lights, no screens, nothing. It was just a big, empty gymnastics floor. And... Hundreds of faithful volunteers were up, were up here from morning to night. And the very first day that we got the key, I was upstairs in what used to be a Taekwondo studio. And now is our, where Life Kids meets on Sundays and where Resonate Youth meets on Wednesdays, room 220. And everybody else had left. And I think Rolando or others offered, you know, hey, do you want me to help you lock up? I was like, no, I got it. I'm going to go walk around, do one final walkthrough, and, and then we're going to leave. And so... Everybody else had left, and the entire building was, was closed down and locked up, and there's just a couple of security lights on, and I was walking that hallway of 220, and I was overwhelmed by the presence of God. You have to understand, there was no curtain, no screen, no nothing, no stage. It was just a wide open space. I could see from that back hallway, I could see all the way to the other side of the upstairs, and I saw in my spirit, what we are living now. And it was this overwhelming feeling that is really hard to explain. I've had maybe about, I don't know, maybe six or seven of those in my life where it's unquestionable that God is speaking and confirming things. So it was a glorious experience. Amazing. And all that seller financing and, and, and other terms that we, that we were able to negotiate at that time that was miraculous was all built on a five-year plan. And the idea was, okay, well, now that you guys get established in the building, maybe at about you know, four years in, before the five-year deadline, you, know, you can renegotiate and consolidate all into one single loan, not some with one bank and some with the seller. We'll, we'll renegotiate everything into one. And so uh, that was the plan. And sure enough, in 2014, we were actually talking, I was speaking with our corporate board that oversees everything and holds me accountable for the decisions that we make here as a church. And so I said, we're going to start looking for a long-term financing option and consolidate everything into one single traditional loan, if you will. And uh, so uh, that was in 2014. And right at the time we were about to start looking for all of that, um, a banker here from Coppell, uh, decided to uh, stop by, pay us a friendly visit, and said, hey, I've, I've noticed you guys are here, I noticed you guys are at church, and I'm a believer myself, attend such and such church, and 
uh, I would love to see if we can do something to help you out. I, I, do, I do loans for, I do commercial loans, and, and I think you guys would be a great candidate. I said, oh, that's amazing. That we were about to start looking. This is from God. This is amazing. Super nice guy. And uh, so we started talking, and he started telling us about the interest rates. It was going to drop our interest rate that we had with our other uh, bank by 1.5%. The economy was starting to do a little bit better. Things were looking better. And so uh, we were all excited. And so we said, well, what do we need to do? He said, well, just give me a couple of months. I'm going to get everything started, you know, all the, the processes started, and, and we'll, we'll be in contact. So I gave him a couple of months. And, and so I reached out to him uh, maybe in about September of 2014. I said, now, um, just want to make sure that we're still a go. He said, oh, everything's good. You don't worry about a thing. I said, okay, because it, if, if this is not a done deal, then we're going to start looking because we have a little less than a year now uh, to, to you know, renegotiate and refinance. He said, oh, it, it's almost a done deal. Don't worry about it. I said, okay, but like in what terms? Oh, these terms, 1.5% better interest rate for the church. And, and I was like, okay, well, that sounds awesome. That's great. And I, you know, it, it exceeded our expectations that we had and what we were expecting. And so we... we uh, we started this whole process, and so I didn't hear anything back from him. And so we got to October, and I said, I don't want to wait till the last minute. I, I know you feel comfortable about all this, but uh, I want to make sure, because if we reach that five-year deadline, things get interesting, because every, everything that was an amazing set of terms that we had, we will be penalized if we are not refinanced by that point, and it goes from great to terrible to super high interest rates. So, so we, we don't want to wait. Till then, to start worrying, worrying about all that. We want to take care of this now. Oh, don't you worry, Pastor Tim. It's all taken care of. I said, okay. Uh, well, that's, that's great. He said, uh, let's, let's do it right after Thanksgiving. We'll, we'll, we'll finalize all the deal. I said, okay. So Thanksgiving passed. December came. And I said, hey, let's, let's get this done before the end of the year. You know what? It'd be better if we wait till after Christmas and, and after New Year. And I said, oh, I'm getting a little nervous now. Oh, don't you worry about a thing. So January came and I called him up and I said, hey, we have got to move on this or I'm going to start looking elsewhere. He said, oh, don't you worry. Let's set a date. So he set a date for February and he said, we'll come to your, yeah, it's kind of funny, right? It's, everything was next month, next month, next month. So we set the date for February. Pastor Rolando and I are in my office. This man who's a, a, a great godly man, I, I, I want you to make sure and understand that. Um, maybe one day he'll be a part of our church. And because uh, I don't I, I don't have any a animosity against him. You'll know why I said that here in just a second. But uh, that day came, we, we met in, in my office. And I noticed, though, that when he arrived, that two vice presidents of the bank arrived as well, which we were expecting. But I noticed they came in separate vehicles, that, that our local banker here came. And I thought, well, that's normal. They, they work at a different branch downtown in the headquarters. So we come into the office and the five of us are there, our banker, me and Rolando, and then these two vice presidents from the bank that came from downtown. And so uh, while we're, we're sitting there, and so our, our banker said, well, it's, it's good to be here. Finally, the day has arrived, and we're uh, very excited on behalf of the bank to be able to present to you these terms that we talked about, and it'll be great interest rate. And so uh, let, me, uh, let me show this to you. And he starts to slide it across the table. The vice president that was sitting next to him puts his hand down and pulls it back. I thought, well, this is kind of a weird, like, tactic. I mean, it's not like I'm buying a car or something. Like, you know, let's do the back and forth game and go talk to the manager. I was like, what, 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 what's going on? He's like, okay. And so I, I saw our banker get kind of nervous. And so he had a nice organized portfolio thing that he carried with him, folder. And he pulled out a second one. He goes, well, this is, this is not, not the same terms as the first one there. But these are pretty good, too. And it would be like this and like that. And so... He sets it down. He's going to start to slide it towards me. And so he looks over at the vice P and the, the, the vice president. And he, the vice president goes. And so he pulls it back. Now, y'all, you talk about awkward turtle. It got real awkward in the room. So we're just sitting there. No one knows what to say or who should say something. So finally, the banker says, you know, I think we might need to reschedule our meeting. And I'll reach, out back, I'll reach back out to you. I said, okay. So I gave them like 20 minutes, they had left, and I called them up and I said, what just happened? He said, Pastor Tim, I am so sorry. He said, this is like, I, I'm beside myself for you guys, because I know everything I told you. He said, but this morning, the day we had set for our closing, 
the vice presidents had had a meeting with the president of the bank, and the bank has overextended itself, and they are not issuing any new loans. I said, what? He said, yeah. I said, so no deal. He said, no deal. Nothing, not even option B, not even option B. I said, you told me since last year that it was a done deal. Why are you, why are you doing this? He said, I'm so sorry. He said, I don't know. I, I, I know you're going to hate me. I, I would too if I was in your shoes. I feel so bad for you, so bad for the church. I, I, I'm beside myself. I'm so embarrassed. And so I said, I forgive you. Now, it didn't sound like, hey, I forgive you. No problem. It was one of those, I forgive you. <laughs> right? Sometimes as parents, we have those. It's like, I love you. <laughs> what are you doing, Dad? Oh, I'm just measuring you for a shirt. What neck size do you need? <laughs> All right. So I said, I forgive you. So he, I'm thinking, what now? I literally, I told, of course, our, our leadership the, the terrible news. And I literally turned to the old standby brother Google said, church loans. Found, of course, 50 different things that popped up of people who can do church loans. And so we started over, started from scratch. Now we had four months. What would have been over a year turned into four months with a lot of pressure. Now, you remember all the miracle I told you about how we got into this place. I started praying, God, I know you didn't get us in here to just end up just everything caving in and nothing working. And we faced so much opposition. Now, I was telling you about he who laughs last, laughs best. When we were back in 2010, when we were trying to secure the very first time we were going to get into this building, I had people that looked me straight in the eyes and said, you will never get a loan. The church will never qualify for a place like that. Oh, were these Satanists? No. These are people who love God. I've forgiven them too. <laughs> but there's a lot of voices of opposition that come against us. I thought, God, you showed yourself miraculous. It was such a, an incredible thing that we lived. I know that we're, it's not going to all go backwards now. So we started working every avenue we could, trying to get this done. We tried and we tried and we tried, and everything had a delay. We had an additional part of, a piece of property that was a part of the original deal that we didn't need. As a matter of fact, it was kind of an empty lot. Some of you have been around well, remember this, now it's a beautiful parking lot. That's a whole other miracle in of itself. But we used to have additional parking over by Sprouts, by the grocery store. And so we owned that property over there, but the only thing we needed it for was parking. And it was kind of inconvenient because it was a long ways away. And in between was this terrible little blacktop road with full of potholes that people would run over in their car and it'd damage your car and they'd come complain to us. And we're like, great day. That's, that's, not, that's not a convenient uh, and, and so all this, all this stuff that was going on there, and so we almost sold that property three times. And selling that property would have triggered for every door to open for us to refinance. And so we would get, we would get someone interested, and it would be almost about to set closing, and nope, we decided not to. Okay, well, that's all right. Well, that happens once, you know, you get back up and say, okay, we're believing for God. It happens twice, you're like... Okay, that happens a third time. You're like, what is going on? Why, God? And you start to ask, God, why are you letting this happen? And the thing that happened with the bank, God, why are you letting this happen? So we're looking and we're scramming. Now it's May. Now it's June. And now July is about to come. And July hit. And y'all, I lost some hair. And I don't have a lot to spare. <laughs> and I'm thinking... What is going on? The interest rates that were phenomenal, unheard of, that we had had for the first five years became unheard of high all in one month. Immediately affected the way that we functioned internally. Now, the church, thank God, we were able to keep everything moving. But internally, amongst the staff, it was kind of a general answer. If we don't need it to make church happen this Sunday, we ain't buying it. That was basically it. We called that back in the, the, the time in our staff where you brought your own coffee cups for the Keurig machine. 
We didn't spend a dime. We knew that we had to have a miracle, and so we kept on, and we kept on, kept praying. July goes by, August goes by. I'm thinking, there is no way we can sustain this. Well, finally, a few things start to happen. And in this time, we had come down to basically two different banks that we were looking to, to work with that really wanted to help us, and we really liked them. I'll call them Bank A and Bank B. So when everything seems so terrible, and I'm praying, God, why are you allowing this to happen? We can't do this, God. We, we need help. I want to have faith, but God, every, everywhere I look, it seems like we're getting delays and we're getting no's. So in October, November, all of a sudden, property sells at a, a great price, triggers the green light for the banks. And now we have Bank A and Bank B both wanting to refinance us, coming hard after us to say, we want to refinance you. And they are able to do the same interest terms that the original bank back in February that caved where they were going to do. So we're like, okay, well, this is great. we got two options. We went from no options to two options. This is great. And so we start the negotiations with them and, and we decide on Bank A. And so we're we, we've got our property sold. We've got a date set to refinance. And so that date happened in December of 2015. And we were uh, very excited and everything came through. And it was amazing. And we were so excited. And we said, thank you, God. It was six months that were very stressful. But you've been faithful. So thank you, Lord. And we thought the testimony was over. I remember I had asked God, why are you letting this happen? So I get a call after we have signed with Bank A. We've refinanced now for long term as a church. And Bank B calls me and says, hey, what would we need to do to get your business? I said, I told you, we, we're going with Bank A. I mean, you guys are awesome. It's nothing personal, but it just was the best kind of a situation for us, and he said, no, no, what would we need to do to get your business? I'm thinking, we've got the great interest rate that the original bank that, 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 that turned back on us, that they had, had offered. It's what everybody I knew, all the pastors I knew, said, that's a great rate. You won't find anything better. So we said, that's awesome. And I said, well, I, I don't know. I mean, drop the interest rate by 0.75%. He said, oh, well, I don't know if I can do that. I said, I know, I understand, but we're good. But you just asked me, what, you know, what do we need to do to get your business? I said, we're, we're good with Bank A. He said, well, give me a week. Less than a week goes by, he calls me. He said, um, well, you're not going to believe this. I asked the bank if we could do 0.75% better than what you guys have got right now, which is already a great rate, Tim. And they said, yes. I said, no way. He said, yeah, I said. I said, well, let me call Bank A. And let them know. So we talked to Bank A. and They're thinking, you know, what can we do to help you guys with our long-term relationship? Because we'd, we'd been with them for a week, right? And so, so I'm like, well, that's not why we're here today. We actually got an offer we can't refuse. And so we're going to actually go with Bank B. What? Yeah, they offered us 0.75% less. That is thousands of dollars of savings over the term of the loan for the church. We have to take that deal. He said, well, I understand. Man, what a bummer. We were really looking forward to working with you guys. That was in the morning. That afternoon, about 4 o'clock, he calls me. He says, hey, what would we need to do to keep your business? <laughs> I said, um, but you'd have to match what these guys are offering us. He said, give me a day. Call me the next day. He said, well, I want you to know something. This is unheard of. As a matter of fact, I'm not telling you guys the numbers. I mean, there's a, there's a, a board and, and, and oversight that knows all this information, of course. But they actually told me, don't tell anybody these numbers because we don't do this. This is unheard of. Don't tell your pastor friends. I sometimes have told a few of them. Lord, I'm sorry. But it's a part of the testimony, right? But they said, we're going to match it. It's unheard of. You will never find this anywhere else. And, and, and I don't know why we're doing this. So I said, all right. Now let me call Bank B and tell them, thank you guys so much. But no. So I called Bank B. They said, no way. 
I said, yeah. And he said, well, what would it take for us to get your business? <laughs> so I said, well, drop it 0.5% more, right? And what do we have to lose at this point? We were already good. Now we're great. What, what, what do we have to lose? He's like, oh, there's, that's unheard of. Man. I don't, I, that's, that's basically prime rate. That's basically like the bank's not going to make any money. I said, I understand, but you asked me, what do you need to do to get my business? I'm just telling you. That's about the only thing you could do. He said, well, give me a day. He calls me back the next day, and he said, well, I was not able to get 0.5%, but I got 0.4% better. I said, what? He said, yeah. I said, all right, well, let me call Bank A. So I call Bank A, and I said, well, guys... I'm really sorry to tell you this, but when I told Bank B that you guys were going to match what they were doing, they've now dropped it 0.4% more. He's like, Tim, you're killing me. You cannot do this. He said, there's no way. He goes, I mean, I'll, I'll ask you, but there's no way. I mean, they're going to be losing money. You realize that? I said, yep. <laughs> and so, so he said, well, give me a day. Calls me the next day. He said, you're not going to believe this, but we'll match it. That's the last one. I said, that's good. That's good with me. That's, that is the last one. He said, stay with us. And in that moment, after six months of major heartburn, literally, and hair loss, and a revolutionized prayer life in the life of your pastor, God reminded me of the time that I asked him back in February. Why are you letting this happen? And God said, now you know. Amen. Now you know why. And I look back now at all the times that we almost sold that property. There was one point that that was going to be eight $1 million homes right behind us, but it would have had a huge wall. Not an interesting thing to talk about right now in this political, <laughs> political climate. <laughs> it was hanging there. Everybody knew it. It was the elephant in the room, right? I, I had to say it. So they were going to build this huge wall and separate out all that, and we would only had one entrance into this. There was going to be a different thing that they were going to build. And finally, what ended up happening when we sold that property was someone who was interested in extending the shopping center off of Sprouts. Now, the only thing we needed on that property, and it wasn't always that big of a deal, this was a special event, was some extra additional parking. The person we ended up selling it to, the arrangement that got made, is first of all, that the way that they were going to construct that, it was a requirement that they had to build parking around the back. See, originally, they could have just built something, and we would have just seen the back of a building. And what we used to have to drive across this crummy little road and go way far away to get some additional parking. Have you all noticed the beautiful extension to our parking lot, our parking lot, <laughs> that God decided to have somebody else pay for that we never had to build? That's the way God does it. So why do I say all that? Because you might get fired up this morning and say, I'm ready to look forward in faith. And then you get a no. And then you get a setback. And then this happens and that happens. And you go, God, why are you letting this happen? And God says, oh, you just wait. <laughs> you thought that interest rate was good? Just wait what I'm about to do in the month of December of 2015. Oh, you might have thought, this is crazy for six months. But what you paid extra in six months, you'll make up in about two months in the year to come. God's ways are better than our ways. You don't have to understand it. You don't have to be able to see it. You just have to believe it. And when you decide to believe it, you start to declare it. And when you start to declare it, then hope starts to rise up inside of you. And then all of a sudden, you start this inertia and this momentum that you're moving forward in faith because you realize that if God is with me, then who can be against me? Doesn't matter what this person said or what that person said because God is faithful. See, it's so much easier... It's so much easier to doubt 
than it is to believe. Anybody can doubt. That doesn't require any strength whatsoever. It's so much easier to do that. But it's so much more exciting to believe than it is to doubt. It's easy to doubt, but it's exciting to believe. It's an adventure. See, the Christian life was never meant to be lived void of faith. And I'm going to say something straight up to you. This this may sound a little bit irreverent, but if you're bored with your Christian life, it may be time to activate your faith because the Christian life is not boring. If you're willing to continue to walk in faith, you are about to see some exciting, miraculous things that are going to happen. But to do that, you've got to be willing to look forward in faith, to declare things and say, even though I don't see it, even though everything seems like it's coming against me, I believe. And God is going to do something miraculous. Matthew 17, 20, Jesus says, you don't have enough faith. I tell you the truth, if you had faith, even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it would move. Nothing would be impossible. So Jesus now makes this connection of faith being like a seed. I've said this to you before, I'll say it to you again. We mistakenly think that we need mountain-sized faith to be able to move a mustard seed. But all you need is mustard seed-sized faith to be able to move a mountain. Don't get those two things confused. Faith is a seed planted in our heart that gives fruit through our mouth. How do I know if faith is growing in my heart? The words that come out of my mouth is the fruit of that seed that has been deposited in my heart. Now think about this for a second. To plant a seed is one of the biggest steps of faith we can take. You're like, what? To plant a seed? No, literally, even in the natural, to plant a seed is one of the biggest steps of faith you can take. You ever seen a kid plant a seed? They plant a seed and they're like, nothing's happening. Where's the tree? Because the whole idea and and, and premise of planting a seed, we are taking something, we are burying it out of sight. I can't see it anymore now. Now I have to believe because I can't operate by what I see. And then waiting for something to happen. Faith is a seed. And when you decide to walk in faith, you may say, that's it, pastor, you're right. I'm going to start walking in faith. And tomorrow, you're expecting to see something. But actually, tomorrow, what you may have to do is bury something. And now you see it even less. And now the waiting game actually begins. That's the way that faith works. But can I just remind you what the psalmist said? That those who plant with tears, they will harvest with great joy. Let me tell you something, guys. I went through some major stress. We as a team, as a church body, went through some major stress. We had some very long prayer meetings during that season. But when we got the final yes, and then when there were two banks, instead of us begging them to give us a loan, they were begging us to let them be the ones to give them a loan. When that happens, then joy starts to rise up inside of you. Say it was worth it. All that time, I learned to depend more on God like I never depended on Him before. And I have seen His faithfulness. And you rejoice at the harvest. (laughs) Abigail showed me this quote this week. She read, I love it. It says, optimism is a seed sown in the soil of faith. Pessimism is a seed hoarded in the vault of doubt. Faith is a seed planted in our heart. Now let's finish up today talking about this. Faith is not a feeling. It is an action. Faith is believing what you can't see yet, declaring what you believe, expecting what you have declared to come to pass. Believe, declare, expect. And there are things that are faith killers and there are things that are faith builders. And here's where we need to pay attention to examine our lives right now and see if we are, if there are things in our life that are going to try to kill our faith or if there are things in our life that are going to build our faith. First faith killer, bitterness. Now, y'all remember back two weeks ago when I said our inability to look back in a healthy way will then limit us to be able to look forward in a healthy way. If you don't heal the way that you look at things that have happened to you in the past, 
it will be very difficult for you to look forward in the correct way. That is why you need to pray, God, if there's any bitterness in my heart, heal me from it. Usually, most times, bitterness is directed at a person. Sometimes it's an event or something that happened, but more more than, than likely, it's directed towards a person. Make sure there's no unforgiveness in your heart towards anybody. So the way that you build your faith is, instead of bitterness, you have gratitude. When you look back, you choose to say, God, even though it was tough, I say thank you. I choose to be grateful. Another faith killer is sin. Straight up. It is very hard to walk a life full of faith if you are living in persistent sin. That's pretty obvious to all of us. It's, it, it, it's not that big of a, of a revelation, but I have to remind you of that today. So the faith builder is righteousness. Because the psalmist said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging for bread. And you know, God, you're going to be faithful. I'm your child. I've been bought with a price. I'm going to walk in righteousness. Third faith killer, negative words. So how do we build our faith? Instead of negative words, we speak prophetic words. Now let me explain to you the difference between positive words and prophetic words. See, an optimist, and it it is good to be optimistic. I just read you a quote about that. But let me explain to you just for a second something even more powerful than optimism. Optimism is the ability to look at a difficult situation and find the best case scenario out of it. It's the whole, the glass is half empty versus the glass is half full, right? So we, we could look at that, and if, if we're a pessimist, we say, oh, well, the glass is half empty. The optimist says, oh, the glass is half full. But prophetic word says, there is no glass, but one day it'll be overflowing. <laughs> Y'all see the difference? Because remember, this is not about eyesight. And optimism requires eyesight. It's an interpretation of what you can see. Prophetic words require vision to see what's not there yet and declare it's going to be there. So we're we're not going to choose between a glass half full and a glass half empty. We're going to choose that God is going to create a new glass and it's going to overflow with his blessings in Jesus' name. Amen? So this year, look back in gratitude, look down in humility, look up in hope, look forward in faith. How do we do that? Hebrews 12.1. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. We said this is how we're going to look at 2019. You know where we need to be looking? Looking at Jesus. Looking back at the cross of what he did for us. Looking back at the tomb and the power of his resurrection. And looking forward to that resurrection power that lives inside of us. And declaring what his words say about our life and about our future. This is how we look forward in faith. I want to pray with you today. Heavenly Father, I thank you for every person in this room right now. Thank you for every person who's watching us right now. And I ask God that there would be just a an incredible revival of faith that would well up inside of us right now. For those who entered into this year with absolutely no faith, as a matter of fact, with a lot of fear, we come against that right now and we declare the word of the Lord. And God, we don't want to just speak positive words. We want to speak prophetic words. We want to declare what we can only see in the spirit, what's invisible right now in the natural. We declare that over our lives. We declare that over our career. We declare that over our marriage. We declare that over our family. We declare that over our health. Right now in Jesus' name, we are going to be a people full of faith. We're going to be a church that is on fire, that is experiencing a revival of faith, God. So everywhere we look, when we have programmed ourselves to be pessimistic, to to expect or to fear the worst, God, let us begin to expect the best. And Lord, open our eyes to see the things we can't even imagine yet, because your word says that eye has not seen, ear has not heard. It's not even come into our minds the things that you have prepared for those who love you. And God, we love you, and we want more of you today. So God, let faith arise in this room right now. Let there be a revival of faith in our hearts right now, God. We give you this year On a personal level, God, as a family, God, as a church family, we give you this year and we say, let us be a people full of faith. In Jesus' name, 
with every eye closed as the Holy Spirit starts to, starts to show you and reveal to you those areas where faith needs to be resurrected in your heart. I want to talk to our friends who right now maybe have never begun your life of faith. You've never trusted in God. You've maybe heard about Him, maybe you even come to church quite frequently. But right now, you, you realize that you have not completely sold out to Him and given Him everything. Romans 10, 17 says, So faith comes from hearing. That is hearing the good news about Christ. And today I want to tell you some good news. That Jesus Christ died on a cross so that you could have forgiveness of your sins. And He rose again from the grave and ascended to heaven. He conquered sin and death. And He wants to give you new life today. He wants to give you abundant life. And He wants to give you eternal life. And all you have to do to receive that is believe. believe. But I can't see anything. I know. That's why it's called faith. Because you're believing in something you can't see right now. But I want to tell you, it's more real than anything you can touch or feel or smell. So right now, if you're in this room and you want to make Jesus the Lord of your life, if you want this to be the day that God forgave you of all of your sins and that you committed your life to Him, I would love to say a word of prayer for you and lead you actually in a prayer that you will say to God. It's not going to be complicated or long, but I'm going to lead you in this prayer. If there's anyone in this room that wants to make that decision today, would you just raise your hand and keep it raised for a second? I want to celebrate with you and I want to pray with you. We're not going to ask you to stand. We're not going to ask you to get up and go to a different room or come up front. Just right there where you're seated. All we want to do is for you to make a decision today and signify that decision by lifting up your hand Showing God, today is a day I'm making a decision to follow you. Thank you, Lord, right now for what you're doing in this place. Today can be the day of salvation for you. If that's you, would you just raise your hand? Keep it lifted high. Thank you, Jesus, for every life in this room. Do your work right now, God. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. God, I thank you for your salvation that comes by hearing the good news of Jesus Christ. I thank you, God, for the faith of every person in this room. I ask, God, that you would strengthen all of us to grow closer to you. Be our Lord in every area of our life. We submit to you. We rejoice in you. We want to do your will. And we want to live a life full of faith. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap for what he's done today. Amen.